The biological clock that Michel Seifer's experiment revealed is the clock that governs our bodies. From single-celled organisms to the most complex mammals, all living creatures are subjected to biological rhythms. Everything obeys the pace of life, a time that is not linear, but punctuated by a succession of cycles. The sun imposes its rhythm of 24-hour cycles on most living organisms. Even flowers, if kept in the dark, will open at the time they normally would outdoors. In the 60s, the discovery of man's biological clock opened up a vast field of new questions. How does it work? Does it have an impact on our lifespan? Could we adjust it in order to stretch out our days, for example, from 24 to 48 hours? This question holds particular interest for space and military research. For the entire decade, Michel Cifre took advantage of the huge stir his discovery created. He received backing from the French army and NASA researchers, and he got his friends involved in his research, dubbing them speleonauts. That is how Josie Lores became the first woman in the world to live beyond time for three months. Luckily, the conditions were much better and more comfortable than Seifer's, but psychologically speaking, the experience was still extremely grueling. There were definitely times when I couldn't take it anymore. I even wrote out my will. I felt morally deserted. Deserted. Like a real guinea pig. Yeah, a real guinea pig. A willing one, but still a guinea pig. The monthly cycle was the real problem for her because of her period. Josie's menstrual cycles were very regular, both before and during the experiment. When she got her period only 10 days after the previous one, according to her calculations, she realized she'd been way off in her time estimates. She had more faith in her own clock, in her hormones, than in her psychological estimations of time. Like Sifla, time seemed to move faster for her but her periods would let her readjust her estimate of the actual time she'd spend underground. Other speleonauts, all friends of Michel, spent three to six months like this underground. For the self-taught Sifra, turning the underground into the world's biggest biological rhythms research lab was a way of thumbing his nose at official science. In the process, he hoped speleology would earn points with space research and industry. It wasn't so great being my friend in those days. I stuck almost all my speleologist friends into caves for months at a time. They all agreed, they all volunteered. I never lifted a finger to find someone to go underground. Then something incredible and completely unexpected happened during one of these experiments. A speleonaut broke out of the 24 and a half hour cycle and fell into a 48 hour rhythm. You slept the longest, 34 hours, and gave me the biggest scare of my life. I almost went down to stop the experiment because I thought you were dead. But I could hear you snoring in the microphone. That's what saved the experiment. I figured as long as he's alive, we'll wait. Half an hour later, you woke up. That's right, I remember it perfectly. It was a day I followed tedious instructions. It took 20 hours, I think. I was extremely tired and that completely threw my rhythm off. I think that's what started my 48-hour cycles. For three weeks, Weeks, you had these days when you were up for 34 to 36 hours in a row and then slept for 12 to 14 hours straight. Incredible. Sifra figured that if it was possible to double one's waking time, the implications were endless. Imagine super soldiers that hardly ever slept, 
or astronauts conditioned to sleep 15 hours then stay awake for over 30 at key moments. For three decades, researchers have wondered about the potential flexibility of our biological clocks. Yet, the appearance of these 48-hour double cycles remains a mystery. Because so little is known about it, NASA still prefers to maintain 24-hour cycles until we can learn more. In 1972, Sifre was so perplexed by this enigma that he decided to go back down under the ground himself in Texas. He couldn't understand why his friends shifted into 48-hour cycles, but not him. Was it merely a question of time or of the individual? If he stayed isolated underground longer than the first time, would he go from a 24 and a half to a 48-hour cycle as well? So even though he swore after Scarasson that he'd never do it again, he now began preparing for another isolation experiment, this time for six months. Michel had just gotten married, so he invented his own special brand of honeymoon, Beyond Time. Tu prêt? You ready? Uh, ready? Of course. Anyway, even if we're not, we're ready, aren't we? Gotta be. Psychologically ready? Well, I don't have the same fears at all that I had 10 years ago. I mean, I have some, but they're different. Different kind. The problem is, you're going to be observing 24 hours a day, so it's not going to be much fun. This is our experiment together. So, it's not the same. Time to go down. I'm in the hole, I'm there, I'm staying. I've got to win. This time, Michel enjoyed all the comforts that were lacking in the Scarasson cave, a freezer, and the same prepared meals as the Apollo 12 mission crew. There were more tests, physiological, psychological, temporal, and cognitive. His body was riddled with sensors and monitored round the clock, heartbeat, brain waves during sleep, urine analysis. A rectal probe took constant readouts of body temperature. The days were monotonous, but nevertheless pretty busy. Okay. Menu, 211. 211, okay. Okay. Et là, je me suis dit, mais qu'est-ce que tu And then I thought, Michel, what are you doing underground? You're your own guinea pig. You've turned yourself into your own experiment. And I thought, no. I completely lost it. I unplugged my umbilical cord for 10 days. Mais là, but je then I started to feel guilty. À I mean, je me suis at that point I thought, bon Dieu, good God, all those people at NASA who helped you out, they all trusted courage. you and you're letting là, them down. Alors, so I hooked myself back up. Là, and I stayed attached the whole time, right to the end, arrêt, even more than in the first two months. At the end of the experiment, Michel Sifre was able to confirm that the circadian rhythm isn't rigidly set. His cycles went from 24 and a half hours to 28. Apparently, age has an effect on our biological clock. That being said, he never reached the long 36 or 48 hour cycles like some of his speleonaut friends. It seems some people's biological clocks are more rigid than others. Today, four decades of research have given us a better understanding of how our biological clock operates. It is made up of two small groups of cells called suprachiasmatic nuclei that control our behavior. Like an orchestra conductor, they trigger the release of hormones that allow us to fall asleep or stay awake. At night, these suprachiasmatic nuclei 
work via the nervous system to activate the release of a hormone called melatonin, which passes into the blood and throughout the entire body. This hormone, which began to be understood in the early 80s, is only produced when it is dark. Without this clock, our schedules would be completely mixed up. We'd wake up at any time of day or night and fall asleep suddenly with no warning, like narcoleptics. As we grow older, our biological clocks are thrown off balance and our sleep patterns change. In late 1999, at the age of 60, Michel Sifre became the guinea pig of one last experiment to investigate a question that had been eating away at him, the effect of aging on his internal clock. Allô? Bon, on peut faire une séquence de test, uh, Sylvain, s'il te plaît? Okay. J'attaque. Attention, top. Fin 1999. It was late 1999. I was out in my garden. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I didn't have a contract. I wasn't doing anything. And all of a sudden, I remembered how John Glenn, the first American astronaut, had gone back up in space on the shuttle two or three years earlier at the age of 77. And I thought, I have to do the same thing, the same thing I did back in 72. Deep down in the cave of Clamouz, Michel Sifre was the last man on Earth to welcome the new millennium. While the entire world was celebrating on January 1st, 2000, he thought it was only December 26th. At the age of 60, his biological clock was regulated again around 24 and a half hours, but his sleep was fragmented. He slept less at night and took a lot more naps. As we grow older, our clocks begin to function abnormally and our entire bodies are affected. Maybe the ultimate question is, how to crack the secret of the clock to slow down its unavoidable deterioration? In fact, the biological clock has an influence on our lifespan. Apparently, it is programmed for a specific number of cycles, and once the countdown has ended, we die. A study on lemurs from Madagascar revealed an astonishing outcome. These tiny creatures generally live eight years, which is 16 tropical seasons, two per year, one period of long days, one period of short. In the lab, the length of the seasons was divided in two by adjusting the light. The lemurs' internal clocks counted 16 abnormally fast seasons. As a result, they aged and died twice as fast. An animal that's four years old, still relatively young, will have the impression that it's lived twice as long, that it's lived through eight seasonal cycles. But what if we manipulated the cycles in the other direction? Would it be possible to extend the lifespan? This time, however, the experiment failed. Because when the lemurs' seasons were lengthened, their cycles stopped responding. After a while, their internal clocks no longer obeyed the artificial light and started operating independently, as if they lived in total darkness. Our biological clock remains a mystery and isn't so easy to fool. The extreme complexity of this living metronome will no doubt obsess those looking to control it. Man doesn't understand time. The greatest philosophers and mathematicians have examined the question, what is time? Personally, I have no idea. 
I've lived almost a year beyond time, outside of physical time, in a microcosm of darkness where time doesn't exist. During those three experiments, I tried to understand what time was, and I came up empty-handed. Today, I have no clue what this thing we call time really is. Today, I'm convinced, and this is something I've talked about with serious scientists and astronauts. I'm absolutely convinced that as we get closer to making the trip to Mars, our experiences with these beyond-time experiments are going to help prepare the space flights to Mars.